be. I trust that you're looking forward uh, to the time of the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've already got your ticket punched. It was paid by the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross and you're ready to go. Well, if you have your Bible open to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. We'll continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. We've gone verse by verse. We've gone through the Beatitudes. And now and then we've studied how that what Jesus said about us, that we're to be the salt of the earth, we're to be the light of the world, we're to let our light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And then beginning with verse number 17, he, he tells us a little bit more about himself even and about the fulfilling of the law. And so beginning with verse 17 in Matthew chapter 5, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed of the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the public reading of the word of God once again. And again, the, for the opportunity to come together to the Lord's house on the Lord's day. You've blessed us already with a good time of fellowship. You've blessed us with a good time of singing and worship. Lord, we ask now that you would indeed bless us with your presence and by the preaching of the word of God that you would draw us near to, near to thee. And Lord, we pray as always that souls can be saved and lives changed and revival come and we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. May be seated. I, I, I call your attention once again to verse number 20 uh, and again where he says, For I say unto you, now, when he says, I say unto you, understand, he means what he says, I say unto you. And so that means you, that means me, that means his disciples in this day that were gathered with him in that Sermon on the Mount. He says, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no way or in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. That verse right there, is a real key verse for understanding uh, the Lord's teachings uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Matthew's Gospel, let me give you just some, uh, some thoughts here uh, that will help you in your study. Matthew's Gospel can be called the Kingdom Gospel because there is an emphasis in Matthew on the Kingdom of God and on the Kingdom of Heaven. The word kingdom is actually found in 150 verses in the New Testament. And out of those, 54 verses are in the book of Matthew. And there are two verses that refer to an earthly kingdoms. Uh, and there is one verse in the New Testament that refers to Satan's kingdom. And so all the rest of it is all about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of, of heaven. In fact, Matthew begins that way. Back over in chapter number 3, chapter number 3 and verse, uh, verse 1 and verse 2, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then also in chapter number 4, verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And so you see here in the very beginning of the book of Matthew, much is made uh, as far as emphasis on the kingdom. Uh, and In Matthew chapter 10, verse number 7, here is a time when Jesus sent out his 12 disciples on a preaching mission. And there he said to them, giving them instructions, he said, And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now the Sermon on the Mount uh, is to teach us how 
the members of the kingdom ought to live. Amen. We've said it in another way. We've said the Sermon on the Mount really teaches us about living the Christian life. About the Beatitudes. The attitudes that, that, uh, that ought to be in our lives as Christians. And, and really when the Bible describes the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. That Jesus went up into a mountain in verse number 1. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And then he began to teach them. And so I've mentioned to you already, really the Sermon on the Mount, you could say that it's a sermon for believers. It is a sermon for disciples, though you can see the gospel in the teaching of the Lord Jesus uh, for, for lost people uh, and their need as well. But the emphasis is on the believers. The emphasis is on disciples. The emphasis is on those who have been born again and thus are actually members of, of his kingdom. And so it's to teach us uh, how the members of his kingdom are to live. There, there is a kingdom, by the way. You understand that? There is a kingdom and, that, and Jesus is the king. Amen. John chapter number 18. Uh, you'll remember this, I think, beginning with verse 33. Uh, 33. Jesus is standing before Pilate, John 18, verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? And Jesus answered. Now watch this, verse 36 of John chapter 18. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom uh, not from hence. And so I believe it's three times in one verse, Jesus speaks of his kingdom. And so there is a kingdom and Jesus is the king. Pilate said, uh, therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth uh, heareth my voice. When Pilate asked him, are you a king? Jesus said, you got that right. He said, you said I'm a king. He said, that's right. You got it right. There is a kingdom, and Jesus is the king. Now understand this about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, first of all, there is a spiritual kingdom right now. A spiritual kingdom right now. In Luke chapter 17, verse 21, uh, Jesus said, The kingdom of God is within you. And so there's a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom right now. This is the result of being born again. This is the result of the new creation, being a new creature, as uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. That's the kingdom of God within you, you see. And so it's a spiritual kingdom. But then also the Bible teaches us how that there is a kingdom after death as well. There's a kingdom not only now, but spiritual kingdom now, but there is a kingdom after death. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, the Apostle Paul writes about how to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And so there is a literal uh, kingdom after death. There's a literal physical kingdom that will be on the earth at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the thing about it is, you cannot enjoy the kingdom of heaven that is promised after death, that is to be absent from your body and to be present with the Lord. You cannot enjoy that kingdom of heaven and you will not live in the millennial kingdom uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth at his second coming if you do not first enter into that spiritual kingdom. And so in other words, to be in the kingdom in heaven and to live with Christ when he comes back to the earth and sets up his kingdom on the earth, friend, you'll never, you'll never know it. You'll never be in it uh, unless you're, first of all, a member of the spiritual kingdom now. That is being born again, trusting Christ. And the thing about it is, here in Matthew chapter 5, we've learned, we're learning this, that you cannot enter into that kingdom, that is that spiritual kingdom, that you must be a member of 
to, to go into the further kingdom of heaven and, and of the millennial reign of Christ on the earth. Uh, you cannot enter into that spiritual kingdom, listen, without righteousness. You, you can't do it. And in, in, in uh, 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 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, the Apostle Paul said, Know ye not that the unrighteousness uh, that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't have God's kingdom without righteousness. And, and yet in verse number 20, Jesus says really a powerful statement here. He says, for I say unto you that except your righteousness, so your individual, your personal righteousness, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now the scribes and the Pharisees, this would have been a bold and a strong statement to those disciples of the Lord who were Jews uh, in that day. Because to them, the scribes and the Pharisees had the reputation of being righteous. They, they had the notoriety of being righteous men, righteous ones. I mean, that, that's, that's what they were thought of. They were thought to have so much more righteousness than the common man in that day or than anybody else in that day. So don't you know that this really probably began to puzzle them? Maybe it even began to worry them a little bit. Maybe some of them began to think, well, what about me? I, I, I know I, I'm not near as good as a scribe or a Pharisee, but Jesus says basically, listen, if he talking to his disciples in Peter, John, James, understand this. If you're not actually better than those scribes and Pharisees, you're not making it into the kingdom of heaven. And so you can't enter into that spiritual kingdom without righteousness. And so the question then is, how can I have righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees? Here's the answer. And, 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 and we need to understand it. Verse number 19. It's by fulfilling the law. The way you have righteousness that exceeds the scribes and Pharisees is to fulfill the law. Notice in verse number 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You see, we are accountable to the law. We really are. We're accountable to the law of God. If you break one commandment of God, you are guilty of breaking all the commandments of God. James chapter 2 verse 10, the Bible says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. And so here, here's the thing, understand, we are, we are accountable to the law. Now don't miss this. We are accountable to the law but we cannot be justified by the law. Galatians chapter 3 verse 11, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. And so Jesus tells us here now that as far as the law is concerned, it cannot be done away with. It must be fulfilled. But, 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 but here, here's, the, here's the problem. We can't do it. You can't do it. I can't do it. I, I, I can't fulfill the law of God. I'm a sinner by nature and in my flesh. And, and I, I don't have the ability to fulfill the law of God. And so, and so what, 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 what do we do? There is only one who can fulfill the law of God, and that is Jesus. Amen. He can do it. In Romans chapter 10, verse 4, the Bible says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And that's what Jesus is saying here in the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying to his disciples and to us, look, you can't do it. You've got to have it. But you can't do it, but I can. He says, I can fulfill the law. And so notice in his uh, mission in verse 17, verse 18, look at that once again. His mission. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. You see that? Jesus said, that's what I've come to do. I've come to fulfill the law. 
And then he said, verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth uh, pass, uh, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So here's, on, here's the thing to understand. You, you, cannot, you cannot do away with God's law. You cannot do away with God's word. But God's law must be fulfilled. And, and, and it must be fulfilled in order to have righteousness. And so his mission on earth was to fulfill the will of God and to complete the scriptures. Everything in the Old Testament, think of this, everything in the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, everything in the, law, in, in the Old Testament uh, has that purpose of pointing us to Jesus Christ. It's all meant to, God's given it to us in our Bible, in the Word of God, to, to point to Jesus, to point us to Jesus, to lead us to Christ. Uh, that's the whole purpose of it. And Jesus says that He did not come to destroy it. He said He came to fulfill it. He said this law is never going to pass away. The law of God is never going to be done away with. The law of God can never be annulled. It can never be canceled. But it's got to be fulfilled to enter into, uh, into the kingdom. And, and so he says, that's what I came to do. I came to, not to destroy it, but to fulfill the law of God. And so how did he do it? One, uh, a couple of things. One, he fulfilled prophecy by his presence on the earth. He fulfilled prophecy by his presence on the earth. I mean, think of, of it. His coming to the earth that first time, the, the virgin birth, the uh, John the Baptist as the forerunner of Christ that said, uh, you know, to prepare the way, uh, and then Jesus himself, his preaching, uh, the miracles that, that he performed, his, his crucifixion on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. Did you know that all of that was foretold by the prophets? All of it's in the Old Testament. All of it, the prophets of the Old Testament uh, told us of all of these things of His coming to the earth for the first time. All of these things and all that He would do. Back over in Luke chapter number 4. Luke chapter number 4. And I'll read a few verses there. Verse 16 down through verse number 21. Then Luke's Gospel chapter 4. Listen to this now. It says, And He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, that is another spelling for Isaiah, Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. You see, he's fulfilling the prophets. And, and he's, he's actually even early in his ministry on the earth, he's letting the people know, letting the Jews know that he came to fulfill uh, the prophets uh, over in John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4. This is that account where Jesus is meeting with that Samaritan woman at, at, at the well. And you remember that. And, and in John chapter 4, it tells us how that he had a conversation with a woman and then she goes her way and she meets up with some of the men in, in the town and told them that, that, she, that she's found the Messiah. Said, said, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? In verse number 29 in John chapter 4. And, and then in verse 30, then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. His disciples had been away. When they come back, they saw him. You know, he was speaking with the woman at the well. And, and, uh, but he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Uh, Therefore said his disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said unto him, and Watch this, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Jesus came for the purpose of doing the will of the Father. 
and of finishing that work and accomplishing that work. And so what we're talking about, all it, it, to, to accomplish and to finish all that the law and the prophets and the Psalms had already told them about, already been recorded in the Word of God, already recorded in the law of God, it all pointed to the coming of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, now I've come to fulfill all of this. And so he fulfilled prophecy just by the fact that he was here. His presence on the earth. He fulfilled the law by his practice. By his practice on the earth. Fulfilled prophecy by his presence on the earth. He fulfilled the law by his practice on the earth. Again, in our, in our text in verse number 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. So he fulfills the prophets by his presence. He fulfills the law by his practice because the truth of the matter is when you read the gospel, you understand there, there is only, the only man ever to live a perfect sinless life was Jesus Christ. He was the only one. He was the only one. And, and he tells his disciples now, said, if you don't have righteousness that is better than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not going to make it. And then we understand now when, when we hear that statement, our response ought to be, well, 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 Lord, I can't do that. In myself, I don't have this righteousness, and it's true. We are sinners come short of the glory of God. Amen or oh me. But that's who we are. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. There's only, there's only one man that's ever stood on this earth, on the ground of this earth, that ever walked this earth and walked among people and went places and talked to people. There's only one person that has ever had such righteousness. There's only one that's ever been sinless, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. In uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, you remember the verse? For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter chapter 2, if you'll remember verse 22 and verse 23, speaking of Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his, in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He just came to fulfill uh, the law and the prophets and fulfill uh, the word of God. Even to Pilate, when he stood before Pilate, the Roman governor. You remember two times in John chapter 19, verse 4 and verse number 6, as Pilate examines him, Pilate makes a statement, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him at all. I, I, I don't see any unrighteousness in him. I see no sin in him. And, and so, you see, we're talking about how he practiced, how he lived, how he walked this earth, how he spoke to people, the things that he did, and everything about him, even Pilate, that Roman governor. And, and by the way, if, if you can just think for a moment about what we have learned and maybe what we know about that Roman Empire, uh, much like days that we're living in now, very sinful, uh, there, you know, and, and I, I don't have to mention the things that we kind of attribute to those times and to the Romans and so forth. And so if, if it came to somebody, you know, something about sin, I'd say Pilate would know about it. <laughs> I, I'd say he'd be, he'd be able to understand it. But he looks at a man and he says, I don't see any on him. I don't see anything in him. I, I find no fault in him at all. He is the only one that that could ever be said about. He is the only one that actually fulfills the law and the prophets. That's his mission. And then notice his message in verse 19 and verse 20. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the, these least uh, commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's his message. His message is this, and listen carefully. His message is that we are held accountable to the law of God. We're held accountable by God. It's his law. 
And we must have righteousness in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. But our righteousness must be more than religion. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees, they made a religion of righteousness. They had a religion of, of righteousness. And that, that, was, that, that was them. They had a religion of righteousness, but Jesus says that theirs was not enough. Their religion of righteousness, hey, that's not enough. That's, in other words, he, he would like say to his disciples, look, in all that they do and, and all that they're known for, you need to understand this, that's not good enough. You can't enter into the kingdom of heaven based on that. Uh, if you, he says it's not enough. If you would enter into his kingdom, then, then our righteousness must be more than that. It must be more than the religion. It must be more than the, the works. It must be more than that of the scribes and Pharisees. And see, the thing about it is, we have no such righteousness ourselves. That's really the point that Jesus is getting across here. We have no such righteousness like that ourselves, but he does. Jesus does. And Jesus fulfilled the law of God. Now here's, here's, how, here's where it comes to us. Jesus fulfilled the law of God on our behalf. When he died on the cross. You see, because according to the law, sin had to be punished by death. It, it had to be. The wages of sin is death. Uh, for the law to be fulfilled, someone had to die. For forgiveness to be given, someone had to die. For salvation uh, to, be, to be offered, there had to be a sacrifice for sin. And that sacrifice, and the only sacrifice that meets the standard, it had, it had to be blameless, had to be innocent, had to be perfect, and it had to be a sacrifice of blood. And so here's the thing. Jesus says, look, if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, if you're going to be saved, you've got to have more, the, more righteousness than the scribes and the Pharisees. You've got to have more than just religion. Uh, you've got to have a sacrifice. Jesus fulfilled all of that for us. In Galatians chapter number 3, Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 13, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree. It's as if Jesus says, Look, I, I know in teaching this, you've got to be better than the scribes and Pharisees. I know, you, I know you're not that. He says, But I am. And the one that is the I am, he is the one that was nailed to a cross. He is the one that was sacrificed. He is the one that shed his blood. He is the one that has provided the way. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We don't have that of ourselves, but we can have it in him. And we can have it in him because of the cross. How can I have the righteousness that is, exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees? It is simply this. And, and here's what so many people, so many religious people miss. But it is simply this. You can have it and I can have it when we have his righteousness. We have to have his, not ours. Romans chapter 3. You know the verse, verse 23. I'm going to read it and then point out the verses following. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. And I've taught you the meaning of that word propitiation. A good way to remember it is, is by saying the atoning sacrifice. But it, it really means... Uh, that which satisfies. It satisfies. In other words, listen to this. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross satisfies the law. 
It satisfies the law of God to which we are all held accountable in the sight of God. The death of Jesus Christ is what satisfies it. The blood of Jesus Christ is what satisfies it. And it, and it satisfies the law of God to do this. Now watch this carefully if you're looking at it. Romans chapter 3, verse number 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, listen, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And then he said it again, make sure that we get it. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You see, dear friend, the point of the matter is, you can't get to heaven because you joined a church. You can't get to heaven because you've been baptized. You can't get to heaven because you have participated in religious activities. All of those things are good. And all of those things we should do. But that is not what gets you to heaven. The only thing that gets you to heaven is to be justified in the faith of Jesus Christ and to know that he took your place on the cross and he shed his blood to make your payment to pay the price for your soul, to pay the price for your sin and for my sin. He shed his blood to provide the forgiveness of our sins. The only way that our sins can be cleansed, the only way that they can be uh, taken away, he did it by his own blood. You remember how John the Baptist said early on, behold the, the, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Why would he call him the Lamb of God? Because he's the one that would be the sacrifice. It's because of the blood that would be shed on Calvary's cross. And so you've got to have his righteousness. Well, how do you receive his righteousness? First, know that you are unrighteous. And, and know that you are a sinner. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. Second, you must be convinced, convicted of your sins and you must be ready to repent of your sins and, and you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive Him by faith into your life. That is the only way that you enter into the kingdom of heaven because, and watch this, because it is the only way that you can have the right righteousness that is required to enter into God's kingdom. Even the scribes and the Pharisees, their righteousness was not good enough. Their righteousness would not save them. And if it's true for them, it's true for us. Their righteousness would not save them, but Jesus would save them if they, if they would have just turned to him. And, and, and all of us today, uh, your righteousness cannot save you, but Jesus, he can save you. And, and so we rest upon his righteousness. I'm not trusting on, on, on myself or my religious activities or, or, or whatever that I have done. I can only trust on him who took my place on Calvary's cross to enter into God's kingdom. And that's what is true for all of us, amen? amen? And so you say, well, how can Jesus say, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven? How, how do you say such a thing? He could say it because it's true. That righteousness of religion doesn't save you. Don't, but if you have his righteousness, then it will save you, amen? And you can have it by faith and trusting in him. Let's go ahead and stand together, church, our heads bowed, our eyes closed together. And let me say just a moment here for someone that may be picking up this message online. Dear friend, if you don't know that you've ever been saved, if you were to die today and you don't know that you'll be in heaven, understand this, you won't be there without righteousness. And you say, well, preacher, does that mean I've got to make some changes in my life? I, I get some things straightened out, then I'll be all right. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Because the truth of the matter is, if, if you go at it that way, you never will straighten it out. You, you, you can turn over new leaf after new leaf after new leaf. You can, you can uh, uh, take courses. You can, uh, you, you can go to meetings. You can do all kinds of things. You can do everything you can to try to make yourself righteous enough to, 
into the kingdom of heaven and, and it will not work. There's only one way, and that is to humble yourself before the Lord Jesus Christ and believe his gospel. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. You can, you can, you can have his righteousness when you receive his gift. And you receive his gift when you believe and you trust and you call upon him in prayer as the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so dear friend, that's what it takes. That's what you'll have to do in order to have the right righteousness to enter into the kingdom of heaven, into the kingdom of God. And our prayer at Grace Baptist Church is that, is that you will, that you will trust Christ and receive him before it's too late. Let's pray together, church. Lord, thank you for the word of God. Thank you again for this wonderful Sermon on the Mount. Lord, uh, just remind us again that all of our salvation, all of our assurance, all of the promise that we have of eternal life and a home in heaven in, in the presence of God, that none of that is made available by any so-called righteousness or religious things of ourselves, but only when we bow our hearts and our lives to you, Lord Jesus, and understand that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to God the Father but by, but by you. And by trusting in you, Lord, we can have your righteousness and we can have the promise of eternal life. So Lord, we pray for, for those that may get this message and that they would truly come to that place of conviction and understanding that they can't make it on their own, but they can, but, but they can make it if they'll just trust you, if they'll just turn to you. Yes. And Lord, we pray that they will, and we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's sing a song together once again, church, as Brother Tim will come and lead us. Page 331.